in here and being um and i'm very grateful I, we are both very grateful to be a part of this even though we're coming to you from outside of uas um we both are affiliated with uaa but these stories come from the culmination of my master of education research project which was done at uaa and i'm guessing some of you have maybe already watched the presentation that we pre-recorded obviously <laughs> for in case there were technical difficulties um which still happen but we basically what we'll do today is kind of go through a synopsis of that presentation in case you haven't watched it. And we have some additional stories because we wanted to share a little bit more um, and then open it up to questions and uh, definitely want to allow people if you have any of your own experiences you want to share to be able to share those as well. So the Everything just went black, but I assume it's still there for everyone else. Um, yes, you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, for a land acknowledgement, um, I want to first acknowledge the land that we are coming to you from today, which is where this project was done. Uh, University of Alaska Anchorage's main campus is located on Denaina Eshena, on the traditional unceded homelands of the Kanatna, who are the indigenous people of what is today the Kinnick Arm. Chester Creek, which runs through our campus, was the site of fish camps where residents harvested food for thousands of years before development interfered with the salmon return. Today, the Kanatna people are members of the Klutna and Kinnick tribes. We acknowledge their stewardship of this land for generations and say chinan, which is thank you in the Denina language. And okay, so okay, last time I did not do this, so don't mind me struggling a little bit. Okay, so we already did the land acknowledgement. That was what, you know, she just spoke on. And now we're gonna say who we are. So I'm Barbara. Hello, my name is Barbara Sikvaiduk. And a few things that you should know about me is where I come from and where I, where I, I am now. I originally grew up in Anaktivik Pass and then moved to a small town called Vitalik or also known as Barrow. In these very small places, it is hard to adapt to a city like Anchorage, but fortunately, I've had the opportunity to experience even bigger places than Anchorage, like Maryland, which was an early introduction to college. I'm now a junior, in, I'm now a junior at the University of Alaska Anchorage, but due to unprecedented, unprecedented circumstances that UAA is facing, I am now transferring to a college in Colorado. I'm hopefully going to continue my education at Fort Lewis College to complete my degree in legal studies to help reform some of the policies and laws that we have today to make a better and fit society. When Valerie reached out to discuss a research proposal, it sparked an idea, but also motivated me to acknowledge implementing indigenous methodologies to our very westernized society. Being a part of this research process has been a privilege and an eye opener, not only for inclusivity in my culture but and heritage, but also to challenge the systems that we have had implemented in our society for a long time. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And then I will introduce Valerie. Hi, so I am Valerie Svenkera. My pronouns are she, her. I am of Czech and German settler colonizer heritage and grew up in Colorado on the land of the Arapaho, Cheyenne and Ute peoples and now live and work on the land of the Dinana, Dinana in Anchorage. Um, I worked in social services when I first came to Alaska and eventually found my way to UAA and worked as an admissions counselor and focused a lot of my attention on supporting students coming to UAA from rural Alaska. Uh, I'm currently a first year advisor and work with first year students from the time they submit an application through their first 30 credits. I completed my master of education in teaching and learning from UAA in December 2019 with the work you'll hear today, although I acknowledge I could not have done this alone. Um, witnessing the institutional barriers our Alaska Native students encountered and hearing their stories along the way shaped this work, along with Barbara and the students who participated, and I am deeply appreciative and grateful for their willingness to share. So for today's session, like I said, we just want to give a synopsis in case you weren't able to watch the presentation yet, but I definitely encourage you to do that and include a few brand new stories uh, shared by students because it was so hard picking. Um, just a couple of quotes for each of kind of the categories. And then we'd love to discuss this with you and welcome you to share your own experiences if you 
have had them. Uh, I don't think students, especially Alaska Native students, are given enough of a space to share their journeys of getting to university and what it's like actually being a student. And if they're, they were given those opportunities, I think there might be a whole lot more understanding, support, and celebration of the, those journeys institutionally. While these stories come from UAA students, I know the data is similar at UAS and are probably many of the same types of experiences um, that some students there have, and so hopefully it resonates. So the basic issue um, is that Alaska Native students come to UAA or really probably any of University of Alaska system colleges and don't stay. In fall 2018, 240 Alaska Native students started at UAA and by fall 2019, 102 students returned, which is less than half. Then this semester, only 68 of that original cohort are enrolled in classes currently. There's a widespread deficit narrative in higher education that blames Alaska Native students for their retention rates rather than identifying institutional barriers or recognizing what each student's experience is actually like. So we held sharing circles with six Alaska Native UAA freshmen two weeks before the end of their second semester to find out about their experiences. When we actually listen to these stories, it's the resilience that stands out. Okay, and then the next page, if I could get it. Okay, there we go. Okay. While we are using Alaska Native to describe everyone who shared, it is important to note that there is a lot of diversity within everyone's backgrounds, cultures, and their experiences. We aren't, we aren't generalizing. We didn't hear all possible experiences either, but from the stories we heard, there were common themes. Family and community are critical uh, sources of support for attending and motivation for persisting. There are so many conflicting emotions but often felt when coming to college or once here. There are new environment and educational systems that had to be learned and which, can, and which can be challenging, but students were able to adapt and make it work for their needs. However, in the process, they had to deal with the perceived impact of their own educational background and, and, they, encouraged, and they encountered racism. Inadequate academic support and concerns about safety being in a new environment. Despite this, they found support and sense of belonging and community through programs for, for Alaska Native students and for those in similar backgrounds. The biggest takeaway was that for every challenge a student experienced, they still managed to continue and finish out their first year. So we wanted to go through these categories and just provide a new quote. So it's a little something new if you've already watched, but if you haven't, you're getting a little bit of a feel for um, some of the stories that we heard. So brand new, this is an additional story shared that expresses motivation for coming to college and some of the emotions that were felt as they seem to be pretty tied together. Um, my sister went to college in like 2006 or 2009. Don't remember because I was young, but looking at her, I wanted to go. And then I found out about nursing and like asking teachers in my village, they said UAA has a good nursing program. I've been like encouraged to attend college by my elders in my village because they would come into the school and talk to kids as well as my teachers who were from the lower 48. And they'd say that education is really important and a good weapon. When I got the email that I got in, I was so excited. When July came, I was like, my chest is hurting, but I'm so excited to go. And then a couple days later, before I left my village, I was packing and I was like, what am I gonna do? Should I just stay? Mostly everybody in my village just graduated and just have a job in the village. And right now there's hardly any job openings. And plus my mom said that I'd be fine. That's what that says. <laughs> and the next one, oh, I'm sorry. Can you see? Oh, and I love the presentation. I'm sorry. And let's go back to view percent. Okay. And so for the next quote, and I think one of the struggles that me and Valerie had when choosing the quotes, we didn't want to 
misinterpret what each of the student had said because we both believe that they were really important. And so another said, another student said that what they challenged, what, what the challenges and concerns of living in a new place was, she said, I got lost. I was walking one of the days, one of the days net program. Okay, I can't see. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, hold on. Okay, hold on. Okay, so I'm going to move this. I apologize. Um, okay, now I can see. I got lost. I was walking. One of the days net program ended, so we had to walk back to our dorms, and I got lost in the rain, and I was soaking wet when I got back, and it was literally, I just went this way and not this way at all. And program for Native students to move on campus earlier than other students in the tent. So the net program, it's a program for students who identify as Native. They have an uh, opportunity to come here a week earlier, earlier so, they so they can get used to the campus. And it's a week long, and I volunteered for that program last two years. Okay, and then the next page. Okay, I'm on my computer now. <laughs> All right, so this was another quote. Um, for students, they had a lot of stories about discrimination and lack of understanding that they experienced a lot of times from faculty. Um, and occasionally just the university in general. So this was an additional story related to that. For me, my English instructor was pretty rude to me a lot of the time. Like I withdrew from her class once and like she apologized to me and she offered to let me back into the class. And so I went back to the class just to get treated really rude again. And so I had to withdraw for the second time. Also, I took an archeology span class and it was nothing but guys and maybe like three girls in our class. It was only like the guys that ever got really any help. It's just kind of surreal, I guess. And then here is another quote from another student about community connection and sense of belonging. The Chimai room was a big one for me because I used to go here a lot and I still do and it's fun. I actually made friends. It was hard to make friends because I didn't know where to go. So this room has a lot of memories for me. When the Chermai room and the people in it made me feel welcome, they made me feel, they made, they make being here feel like home. And Barbara, me, is a big one. She's, she's like, she's just nice and hugs and just makes my day. And NSS, Native Student Services, is one. The people are nice and it's a good place to study. The NET program was helpful. They gave a lot of good information. Okay. Let's see the next person. And this is an explanation of where a student found motivation to come back for a second semester. For me, it's my family and their motivation, the things they say keep me going, that they're proud of me and my friends. I just feel like I need to go to college to, it made me feel independent, so I just want to be here. I want to get the degree I need and to become a teacher, and I feel like I know people are proud of me, and I just want to make them more proud and actually be a teacher. And here's another student about their reflection and recognition and how to improve the second semester. So we talked to the, the students towards the end of the first semester and then we talked to them again at the second semester and one of them said this, I feel like a lot better this semester because I'm passing my classes. I'm doing really good in them. I know where everything is and I've decided like I can't take morning classes either. And so all my classes are either from like one to eight or two to three. And so I really like my schedule because there's hardly anybody in those classes. And I feel like I get a lot more attention because of that. Like my, bis my biggest class only has like 12 people in it and it's pretty great. And then finally, part of what we wanted to also find out from students was if they had any recommendations. Um, based on their experience so far within coming or, and also through their first year um, being a student. And this is what they had to say, kind of an overview, um, that they, a big one was wanting recognition and acknowledgement for what they're achieving or for what, for students who are giving back to their community. Um, 
as well as greater understanding from faculty and staff regarding their backgrounds, cultures, and in general, where they're coming from. They also felt that academic support was lacking or not welcoming. And finally, they expressed wanting every Alaska Native student to be made aware of opportunities specifically for them, as they saw that the benefit from the culturally grounded programs or being able to meet students from similar backgrounds. then what we need to do from here. Okay, so we briefly go through, we brief, we'll briefly go through some of the, our thoughts on what we can be, that can be done from here at UAS and UAA alike. If you work at a university, listening to your students and understanding what they have and continue to experience is really important. Educate yourself on the diverse Alaska Native Alaska Native values and cultures across Alaska to help yourself better understand where they are coming from. Along with what we need to recognize, the importance of community and representation and making sure you are supporting these programs and efforts and efforts and getting students connected to opportunities that might provide support. And the students we spoke with asked for more understanding and some of that should involve incorporating more training. Um, especially for faculty on Alaska Native specific culturally responsive practices in order to make universities more welcoming places for all students. And given the experiences of the students who shared their stories, it might be worth looking at where additional support is needed in onboarding new students and making sure they feel welcomed and like they belong. Overall, institutions need to reframe uh, how they view Alaska Native student success. So for all the ups and downs and barriers encountered and lack of recognition received, Alaska Native student success is the resilience that students display and universities need to start recognizing this so they feel seen and valued and like they belong. And that likely involves making institutional changes to provide better support. And that is our quick recap of our presentation. And we hope this provided you some insight into the experiences of Alaska Native student experiences um, and that there are elements that you might be able to take away from this, especially if you work in a university setting with students. The more we can recognize the resilience of student experiences and students themselves, the more we can support our students to complete degrees and have additional tools to give back to their communities. And there is more in the full presentation. So definitely encourage you to watch it if you haven't yet. So at this point, we'd like to open up to questions. And also if you are an Alaska Native student and you want to share your experience, I think this is a great place for that as well. Um, or if there are things that resonated or seem different, maybe compared to UAA to UAS, I know our sizes are a little bit different. We would love to hear it. Fine, next book. Ah, Amanda, your question. For the NET program, do students pay for the extra week in housing? They, I believe it is set up that way where there is a prorated amount that they pay to be there those extra few days. I wish it were not that way. Um, so there's some work to do there for sure to make it a little more accessible. And actually the NET program has changed. So it used to be the students could come on Monday, all other students could move in, I think on Thursday before classes began. And with our new director of um, Native Student Services, Amber Christensen Fulmer, it is now like a two year cohort program where they're actually making it into like classes that they will take um, together as a cohort through those first two years. And there will be mentoring and um, other things like that. So it's a much more built out, which I think we're all really excited about. This is the first semester that that is happening. So they have, I think, 14-ish students, maybe. Um, maybe not quite that many um, in it right now. Um, this is Amanda. Can I ask another question? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I really appreciate this uh, presentation, so thank you for sharing. Um, I'm an academic advisor at UAS and work with a lot of new incoming first-time freshmen 
um, Associate of Arts students, bachelor intended students. And, you know, many of those students are from rural Alaska and experience everything that that you and Barbara went over. Um, specifically, the Alaska Native success and what that looks like, you know, for our students compared to maybe institutionally or nationally, what success looks like. And I would love um, if you or Barbara or other folks have thoughts on what are some ways that we can reframe, you know, traditional success so that it does reduce barriers for our Alaska Native students and allow them to be successful. Um, if, if either of you or other thought other folks have thoughts, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Do you have thoughts, Barbara? Yeah, um, so I think uh, me and Valerie also talk about this a lot. For me personally, I think it starts being in your home where you live. And so one of the frustrations we talk about is that rural villages, they don't have the necessary means or they don't have the support that they have in cities like Anchorage, Fairbanks, or you know, you know the bigger um, towns and cities. And so when students don't get the proper like education or they don't have the basic necessities to succeed at home and then they transfer to a university, I think there's a lot of struggles that, I mean, I have faced, I've met other students that have faced as well, you know, there are things culturally, like when, you know, someone passes away in your family, that's a really big thing. And I don't think the institution itself recognizes that some students have to leave because of that reason. And so I think it, the foundation for me personally is the home, you know, where you live. And it, it's discouraging, you know, I'm going to be another student that's going to be leaving Alaska because UAA can't provide what I need. So that's my thoughts on, you know, trying to reform and reframe. I think we need to start back in the villages and give them what they need there first and then transition slowly either to the university that you want to go to UAA, UAS or UAF. And and my, thank you. Oh, do you have anything else more you want to say? So my thoughts, and I, I go on rants about this a lot, is how much we focus on grades. And I think at, from an advising perspective, that is what we are, that's like our measure of success is grades and GPA. And that's like how we determine if you can stay and be a student. And um, it is, everything is about that. And I mean, that determines sometimes retention. Like if you don't do well, you might not come back because your grades were bad and there's so much of a focus on that. Um, so I think some of it, like what I, if I were in charge, um, like especially with COVID, which has been really challenging for a lot of our students and definitely some of our Alaska Native students who are in the dorms kind of isolated right now. Um, I think if we could just focus on learning instead of so much on like the end grade, um and really like re look like looking at how assessment is done like from within the classroom because a lot of that doesn't work super well either um and it's such a different way of education compared to like alaska way alaska native ways of knowing um or learning which a lot of times is more hands-on or observational um not really taking tests so or like so much writing with writing um just the value put on writing so i think just re kind of pulling back on how much we really look at the end grade and how we are giving grades, I think could help um, actually support students and more like reflective practices, I think would be really helpful. Um, like the sharing circles were awesome, just having students be able to hear from each other and hear experiences and, and have that time to kind of think about where they've come from and like how they got where they are and how they how they were able to make it through um, their first year. And so I, I think there are other things that we can do that really celebrate students, like Alaska Native students and, and all that they're able to achieve, which a lot of times gets ignored because they maybe don't have 4.0s and that's what we value. But if anyone else has anything to add, I would love to hear it. Yeah. Like, I always feel like I talk too much. <laughs> um, uh, but I see some familiar faces in here from some presentations that I was involved with earlier this week. So 
I'm still really impressed by uh, some of those students. Um, I don't know if she's still in here, but Anastasia was um, one of those presenters. Um, but there's just so much that is, it, that feeds into this whole thing. And one of the things that I think is missing so much throughout the entire system of education, not just at the college level, is that there, you know, in our culture, we didn't have a school. <laughs> and part of colonization came to our communities and thought we were, you know, uncivilized, dumb, demonic, <laughs> whatever you want to put on that list, because our society didn't look like the structure of their society. Like there's no schools, there's no churches, there's none of this stuff. Like what's wrong with you guys? And I think one of the strengths of the way our culture's structure was is missing in the education system where we weren't separated. And I think that that missing piece of, you know, being able to connect from like an elementary student to a college student and being able to see, like, I can make it there. <laughs> and not only I, can I make it there, but, you know, like, th there's representation that they can connect with. And I think the fact that we have such little um, involvement amongst the different grade levels, that that really serves as a disconnect from recognizing, like, there's an opportunity here. And not only is there an opportunity here, but it disconnects that conversation from the younger students. And so it's almost like this wall of invisibility where they have no idea that they can achieve this. And um, hearing what you're saying, Barbara, specifically with the, um, when somebody has passed and you need to leave school, like that, I actually was working, um, for unemployment and I remember that was such like systemic racism you know <laughs> I was immersed in so much of it and it was so hard for me to work in that position because you know especially with uh, unemployment benefits my heart breaks because I want to help somebody like if they if they have to travel home or you know be away to serve something like that again, our traditions, it's not like a, you know, you walk into a church service for a couple of hours and then you leave. It is days long. And whether it's in the education system or our government systems, there is so many ways that we are impacted with systemic racism. Because even in those situations, they're like, if it's not an immediate family member and like that, <laughs> within the native community, like they might not be my parent or my direct sibling, but to deny me based off of the fact that they're, you know, like my aunt <laughs> or something to that effect, like that, that secondary connection, that is so painful. And there's so many different ways that all of this stuff collides. And I think that it is such a detriment to our people because in so many ways we feel alienated. We don't feel like we're supported. We don't feel like our traditions are recognized and it becomes a challenge because if we're in those situations where we do need to travel or we do need to be away from things, um, it starts to be felt as, man, I'm not good at this. <laughs> like, I, you know, there's so many expectations in two different ways. And, you know, the prevailing message from the outside community is no, like, you need to be here, you need to show up. And if you don't, like, <laughs> and so it puts us in such a heartbreaking position. Um, yeah one of the things that I really want to work on and develop <laughs> at a community level is reintegrating some of those cultural um, traditions so that the community can feel it, you know, like we serve our opposites and not just about like, uh, <laughs> you know, we're just here to serve ourselves. 
we're just here to be successful for ourselves, but to really understand and realize, you know, what the value is of following our traditions and customs and how it can provide support to our community to understand that they can succeed and they can be supported. And not only can they be supported and succeed in these systems, but that they can bring value to the future of how we change our schools, our education system, and even the way that we are teaching these, these lessons. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, we've disconnected so much from our traditions and all of those ways that we are compartmentalized do a disservice to us. We're all about community. We're all about supporting each other. And without having that representation on a daily basis, I mean, I don't think in my history in elementary, I don't think I once had any interactions with anybody who was in high school or in college. So it was just like this big mystery, like, why am I even here? <laughs> what is the big picture? And that was the other element to that piece with the systemic racism is that with my former position, it was so devastating to see that, you know, I, I, it got really bad. There were people that would be on the phone with people from the villages and they would be shredding them apart. Like, what do you mean you're unemployed? What do you mean you don't have a college degree? You're always going to be on unemployment if you don't get that degree. Um, <laughs> you're talking to somebody from a village that only has a hundred people in it. You're talking to somebody from a place where it might be completely like it's irrelevant to have a degree for the amount of jobs that they have there and the lifestyle that they're living. So it's kind of like, <laughs> in how many ways are we confronted with these layers of systemic racism? And it breaks my heart to think that that's not recognized or not, that it's not known <laughs> in a general way. And so I, I am so proud of the students that are here and who are doing everything that they can to keep moving forward because there is so much that we're up against. So thank you for sharing everything that you have. Thank you. I appreciate all that. That yeah. resonated with me so well. Sadly, sadly to say that it, you know, how much I can feel, you know, you can go, Valerie. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Thank you. <laughs> I think, I mean, same. Like, I think in terms of big picture, like, what needs to happen is just, like, the awareness that doesn't exist right now of, like, the difference in values and the just the system that higher education is and how it doesn't, it conflicts a lot um, with, like, Alaska Native cultures or Indigenous cultures in general. Um, and there is you don't, you won't foster a sense of belonging if there is no, like, um, representation or, like, just awareness of a lot of those values that are important for Alaska Native cultures. And so I think when we, I think that's, like, I would love to see that because I think it would make such, like, just so much of a difference if people had more of a clue when they really, really, really don't. Um, <laughs> which is sort of unacceptable because we're on indigenous land. <laughs> like, so in the chat, there are a couple of things. It looks like Jacob, you, if you want to share, you were being asked of how Wayne Price um, has made an impact on you. And I'm not familiar. I know who Lance is. I'm not sure who Wayne Price is. Um, so Jacob, if you feel like sharing, you're definitely welcome to share that because I do think there are definitely very influential people who are important and we need to raise them up and that does not always happen but you also don't have to share I guess you typed out an answer let us know feel free to interrupt me <laughs> <laughs> um Danielle yay hi Danielle 
um, also commented about, um, no worries, Jacob, um, about grades. And I think that example of the class you're taking with Mike Kosky is such a, a good point of not focusing on all the little details um, and really just making sure you understand the content and that's where you get the grade from. I think that would make a huge difference because that is, the end. I agree, I think it's the end goal. Like, do you understand the content? Was the knowledge transferred instead of focusing on, I think professors sometimes get wrapped up in all the little details and that can be really harmful um, and discouraging for students who, where everything might be kind of brand new to them. Of maybe previous educational experiences, which definitely was highlighted um, by students who felt like they, coming from a village school, were at a disadvantage because they were, did have these opportunities to learn some of these things beforehand compared to students who were coming from Anchorage or Juneau or Fairbanks. So I think, yeah, that is a, that would be awesome. Other questions or thoughts? Valerie, this is, this is Amy Richards. I'm an ac another academic advisor here in Juneau. And, you know, we certainly, um, as advisors who work every day with students from when they come in to they graduate, you know, being with them on their journey, we see those obstacles. We can easily identify them in our admissions policies, in our petition processes, in interactions with faculty sometimes. Um, but how have you found, or any other staff who are on this call, the best way to advocate? Because even when we bring these issues forward, they get stuck. It's, it's really hard to advance progress on these issues. So I'm looking for, um, for ideas for all of us on how we can advance some of these issues in a way that's effective and, and you know, uh, makes change. For me, and I'm definitely, I mean, I'm not an expert on any of this <laughs> at all. Um, and I think that's my, I 100% hear what you're saying because I, I get very frustrated. I get my hands slapped a lot because um, I tend to bring things up all the time that I think other people don't see or they're just not aware of or they refuse to see or it just seems too hard to try to make it different or they're so stuck in like we've always done it this way. And I think that is probably one of the most damaging things is if we are stuck in that way, then we are definitely not serving our students. Um, I, my current um, strategy is to like find other people at the university who are on board with also advocating for students and who've noticed some of these same things so that we can kind of have this collective voice of, hey, this isn't okay. We're all noticing this. This is, we're all behind this so we can bring it together um, to someone higher up who can help make the change. So just kind of being a louder squeaky wheel collectively um, is my hope to try to get uh, certain things changed. And sometimes it actually works, <laughs> which is always surprising. Um, and I think just having good, like I try to have very good relationships with people across the university, especially for those who are in positions where they could make change, um, even if it's like a little policy change or something like that. And just kind of mentioning it to them a lot or like bring it, sometimes just bringing it up, like sending an email and bringing it up, like, did you know um, this is not really actually equitable? Like we have a, a petition for refund form for students who have to withdraw because of extenuating circumstances. And on that form, there's a statement that if it was from a death in the family, uh -huh. it, and it, it um, defines family as like intermediate family, as like mother, father, or a sibling, which is not, that's not how a lot of things work. Like a lot of times, like we've kind of talked about, if someone yeah. is way in the community, like in a village, you, you have expectations and you have obligations and it impacts you. Um, and so just kind of bringing that up of, hey, this isn't really actually equitable to our students. Like we should actually also allow for a broader sense of like when there's a death of what that means for students. So I don't know if that helps at all. That's my current, <laughs> current strategy. 
Um, and I think right now is such a, an interesting time with the university focusing more on actually supporting Alaska Native faculty, staff, and students that I think now is the time, especially for um, policies that are negatively impacting students um, or any of us. And Teresa, my aunt who lives in Juneau. <laughs> um, the university, so this is my understanding. No, basically there is training, and I'm curious actually if UAS has any training for professors, tutors, or staff. Um, for faculty, I believe there is like a very short, maybe 30 minute training on Alaska Native whatever, like culture, just kind of like a grounding. It is super short, which I don't know how you would even try to do this in 30 minutes. And that is it. That's, that's the training. And I'm not even sure that everyone has to be there. I don't think adjunct faculty probably are always there. Um, and for staff, there's zero. For tutors who are working with students, zero. Like there's nothing. And so we do have the Alaska Native theme GER, so like a lot of our tutors are students, and so if they happen to take an Alaska Native theme GER class um, that is specifically about Alaska Native cultures, they might have some awareness, but there are others that are maybe not as targeted towards like actually teaching about all of the cultures in Alaska. So yeah, it's it, that, that's part of the problem. <laughs> There's nothing. There's no expectation that anyone should know anything. And Danielle, not, not yet, because I have not, this is my first, or like our first sharing of some of these results. Um, so this is our, our practice run before we take it to UAA. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, but I hope so. I think there are a lot of people who are very interested right now. I was in a, a book club meeting with the chancellor who showed up, who, although we only have her for a couple more months, um, and we now have a chief diversity officer. And so they were both in this book club meeting. Uh, and I mentioned that this work had been done and I have like student voices I would like to share. And I plan to do a presentation because um, it just is amazing how many people just don't hear from students or listen to students or think that that would be important so i know that they are there are some higher up people who are very interested so we'll see what happens mm. and also michael yes i am familiar with those i used them in my master's project to look at how uaa could do better <laughs> so um i have my own thoughts on how that could be aligned, but I definitely know that my perspective, I think there are other, other perspectives that should definitely be in there as well. Um, I would love for that to happen though. Hi, um, this is Chow. I'm um, assistant professor of communication at UAA. Hi, um, thank you very much both for uh, Barbara and Valerie for the presentation. I really appreciate it. And I think I can, Talk a little bit on the training at least we had at UA here that um, we had uh, from our cafe session we had uh, we, every semester we have at least one like native Alaskan uh, cultural training for professors to join and that was very very helpful and also very popular so um, our cafe session actually offers this training at least every semester that's what I understand and I also did one for my first uh, semester here at UAA so that was very helpful and I also get that it's a very good kind of idea for faculty members to know how to communicate with those uh, Alaska Native students. Like, um, as I explained, I'm a uh, professor in communication. I remember in my first semester, I, after talking about uh, cultural transitioning as international students and I did have one uh, Native student come here to me, I, I talked with me saying that, hey, I had exactly the same feeling like, like international students. They feel that the cultural, the language is all different and they don't know how to actually uh, assimilate or how to be a, like a student that the prof professor is looking for. So I actually feel that it's a very 
I have to say a little bit shocking for me because I, uh, this is my second year, so I never had any chance to uh, teach uh, students um, of uh, Las Vegas students. And then I feel that it's just a very good, how to say, experience for me. And it op really opened my eyes as a, as a professor, say, hey, we still have lots of different ethnic groups here we need to focus on. So really appreciate your presentation. And, um, I, I would love to, if you're uh, welcome, uh, if you're, you, you don't find it, I would love to uh, learn about more of your studies and maybe uh, we can share and then maybe we can study together and then deep further into this topic if you don't mind with it. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your comments and for sharing that. That is encouraging to hear. I don't think it is mandatory for my understanding. So that's like my big wish. No, this is not mandatory, but yeah, I do really think <laughs> <hope that. laughs> Someday, maybe. To be, to be honest. Thanks. But that's awesome. So just to give a um, sort of a, an example of how cultural training would be uh, effective in helping Native students, one thing that I um, recognize is that silence is a very um, important cultural difference between, you know, Western cultures and um, native cultures. And so going back to the uh, present, the recorded presentation um, where the student was talking about how she wasn't getting help because she wasn't asking questions. Um, it might be a case that, you know, um, she values silence. And so she really doesn't um, ask the questions because of that. And I know that in the math lab, um, the staff doesn't really ask if you need help. They, really, they wait for you to ask for help. And so um, staff knowing about the cultural difference of silence, um, the value of silence, I think that would really help Native students get help when they need it. And yeah, staff knowing that silence is valued and you know, really, um, how do I word this? Knowing that silence is valued and asking students if they need help, if they're silent, yeah, there's, thank you. Thanks, John. I'm so glad you were able thank to. You. That's awesome. I think that's a really good point. I think there are, there's just some little things like that that would make a big difference for sure. Such a good point. And um, John, thank you for sharing. I wanted to, to comment and um, say that as, as an advisor, I recently had an experience with a student um, who is Alaska Native, who's currently in uh, a rural village and they are concerned about their grade in one of their classes because it is a live Zoom session. They are expected to have their video on. They are expected to interact um, verbally by taking their mic off. And the value of silence for them was impacting their participation grade. And they weren't sure how to approach their faculty member. And I, I don't know if I overstepped my bounds as an advisor, but I asked the student, I said, would you be comfortable if I emailed your professor directly and let them know that you are Alaska Native, you're from rural Alaska, the value of silence is important for you, and it's not that you're not wanting to participate, but this is just part of your culture. And the student was okay with that, um, luckily, this particular faculty member didn't have any issues with that, said, absolutely no problem. Thank you for letting me know. And I feel like, um, you know, I didn't know if I was going to be kind of, you know, on the bad side of that particular faculty member for telling them how to grade or, or how to issue participation. but going back to the training aspect is so important because it shouldn't have to be a fight or a battle to say, hey, this student learns like 
this. And, and so oftentimes it is. So um, John, thank you for sharing your story. I, I wanted to uh, agree with you and just share that particular experience. And if you or others, or if there's faculty in this group that have preferences or practices that they do, um, I would love, love to hear that experience. Barbara, there is a question in the chat. Do you want to answer that from Allison? Yes, I was typing it, but I was like, you know what? I might as well just unmute myself. The, the, the yeah, technology is great. So Allison asked, in your opinion, what would the impact be for students if there was a greater percentage of indigenous instructors? I think it would, I think there would be a great, like, it would be a great impact to have people from like different backgrounds, you know, like I think we are so focused on a certain way of learning that we forget that there's so many other ways that we could be taught certain things, you know, even if it's it like, and I don't want to say, I don't want to say westernized, but it is westernized, you know, to be taught uh, like a lesson that's more because I I learned like motion that you see me move my hands, like I feel like when you you can also visually like demonstrate a lesson, you know, and I think as in my culture that's what we do when we teach you know dancing and i i definitely think that you know if we did implement more professors from different backgrounds there would be a, a really great impact if that answers your question um i kind of want to jump in real quick before we run out of time um in terms of changing things there's so much I want to fit into this. Number one, if you have the opportunity, look for the SHI uh, culturally responsive program coming up again in January. I'm currently involved in it and it is, it's a massive undertaking to <laughs> participate in it, but it is so incredible. Um, so if you have the opportunity, take it. Um, and then two, in terms of changing, the dominant part of our society today has so romanticized numbers and not only have they romanticized numbers but also it seems to be that the way to achieve power in today's society isn't through you know like i was saying serving your opposites it's not through having empathy for your others the power is achieved through invalidation and you know <laughs> I don't need to do that because why like we're looking out for our jobs and not you know like basically invalidating the cultural values that we're trying to maintain and uphold um and so as part of that invalidation that's where the romanticizing of numbers comes from so if there's anybody who's here know that there is power in numbers when it comes to government in an advocacy class that i was taking they were like every number counts Whenever there's an opportunity to send an email, a fax, contact your legislators, etc., that is a number that is working in our favor. And so any chance that you get, take that. And when I was working for the Department of Labor, um, there were so many people so who used to file appeals when they had problems with their claims. And a part of the process of filing an appeal is to establish that number within the system to say, hey, this isn't working. <laughs> There's something wrong with this part of the program. And so anytime you have an opportunity to create a number in the system of our government that works in our favor, that tells the system that, hey, this isn't working for this many people, like ring that bell. <laughs> it might feel like it's a massive, you know, like it's so inconvenient, but it serves us. And one of the things that was so frustrating for me in terms of systemic racism within that system was that there was a language issue that I immediately saw. And I was literally like <laughs> this in terms of our corporations and our shareholders, like there is a language issue here that's not 
being addressed and I wanted to correct it, but I was met with the message of, well, that has to be done at the federal level. We can't change the language on our applications without going to the feds. So what it would mean was that I would have to convince the commissioner to take that issue to the federal side of the government. And it was no small feat because then even once it was taken care of, it would be, a, you know, thousands of dollars of effort to change just a few simple words because our department, everything that's on our applications has to be approved by the feds. So the same thing with our educational systems. All of us want so much change, but if we don't have the power of numbers in advocacy at every level of our government, we're still gonna be fighting <laughs> the same battles that we're in. So whenever you have your chance, you contact your representatives, you contact your people who are supposed to be um, leading us. Because the thing is, is with the Alaska Native population, numbers were meant to work against us. And if we don't have the support of people outside of our community, we're not going to see the change that we're working for. If we don't have three people behind us outside of our community helping us achieve those numbers, we're still going to be stuck in this situation where we so desperately want change, but it just doesn't happen. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I like numbers with stories. <laughs> so um, that's my other thing of like, we focus so much on numbers and I get frustrated. So I, this is why we wanted to also bring stories, but yes, there's definitely power in numbers. So I think that is our time and just thank you everyone um, for being here and for listening. And um, if you haven't watched the whole session, it's recorded, it's on the website, please watch that um, and let us know if you have questions or have any other additional thoughts my emails on the full like recorded presentation so thank you for being here it was so lovely chatting with you all and thanks everyone who shared bye next book thank you valerie thank you barbara i really learned a lot from your session and appreciated all of the wonderful chat and dialogue that we got to have afterwards I would encourage everyone to go to the website and our UAS YouTube page to view their full presentation. It's incredibly enlightening, um, especially if you're really passionate about this topic.